Disclaimer. This video contains discussion on mental health and mental health illness, to which some people may be at a discomfort. If you feel uncomfortable with any of the topics, please don't watch. If you're currently suffering from any of the mental health illnesses discussed in this video, please contact your local health service or a mental health charity listed in the description. Thank you. Before we get into the video, I'd like to firstly thank a few people. Anon, of course, for being an absolute chad. Dogs Dogs for essentially being the co-author and co-developer slash co-creator of this video due to the massive help they've provided. And finally, Bean for being a legend. Now, onto the video. can be poisonous and everybody knows it. From the early days of humanity we've strived to be better, to be faster, to be stronger. And yet we've always neglected the brain's health as evolution thought not of the mentality of our race and only for survival. We've developed ways to tame, eat and avoid every danger. We've learned how to fix what is broken within the body and avoid death for over 80 years. We've become sneaky enough to allow ourselves to enjoy the most primal of urges structured into every single one of us. Sex, drugs, my wife. Our race is a mixture of animal and mad god and yet we are still cursed by the ailments we know nearly nothing about and suffer with everything from slightly low moods to manic depression and even suicide. But what does it all mean? How can it all link into the way we've been raised from the childhood of humanity to our species present day adolescence. Well let's take a trip, see what we can find shall we? We all have a baseline, a neutral mood which can be raised and lowered. You might get a present for being a competent human being, or reach a new birth milestone and that'll boost your mood for a set amount of time. Maybe your favourite Frogo shop shut down and you're sad now because you're a psychopath and you like frozen yoghurt. What is wrong with you? Everybody laugh at this bastard. But after a while, no matter how much it affects you, your mood will always return to your baseline or as sciencey people will call it, your hedonic set point. For some people, like your annoyingly cheerful, successful, happy friend, it's quite high. For most people, it's relatively neutral, however, for some poor people, it's quite low. But what dictates your hedonic set point, I hear you ask? Well, that's a good question. You're full of good questions, like the tax man. However, it's not really that straightforward. You can't really control it. Let me explain. Time for a quick personal anecdote to help me explain this point. I play a lot of video games, and not to brag, but I am fucking awful. I played a popular game, a sandbox game, and I'm not going to mention it because I'm too broke to afford the lawyer's fees for being sued, and I came across a weakness of mine, jumping. Now you may ask yourself, is it jumping in a video game or jumping in real life? The answer to that is both. I don't go outside. But anyway, I was playing this game with my friend, and I had to jump over a gap, and my friend, who I shall not name, we're going to call him Tim because I don't want to shame him. However, he knows who he is and he knows what he's done to me. You have permanently scarred me, Tim, and I shall never forgive you. I'm kidding, I love you. Please, please don't leave me. But as previously stated, I'm terrible at video games, so I failed the simple task of jumping. And that was ridiculous. I got ridiculed by Tim. He ridiculed me for the total of 10 seconds, so I partook in 20 minutes of hysterical crying. And then I tried again. And then I cried again, and then I tried a few more times, and by the end of it, I become numb to all of the feelings related to the game. It's a nonsensical story, but it explains how the brain works. It's essentially the same explanation as if I told you a joke, you'd laugh. If I told you that joke again, you'd laugh, but less. So on and so on until the joke is no longer funny. It's occurred to me now that there'd been an easier anecdote to explain this point. To put it into its most basic terms, if you experience something once, the change in your mood is huge, however after experience get 10 times over, the change is quite small and short lasting in your brain. This happens every day, you wouldn't even notice it and it's known as hedonic adjustment, which is the second scientific word I hate. 
Now for a true story, and spoiler warning, this isn't nice. When I was in school, I had a form tutor who was lovely. She was a very kind-hearted woman, yet many children bullied her due to her weight. Now, it was clear her job made her so happy, but the constant bullying slowly flipped her positive outlook on life. She slowly began to lose the passion she once had as it was drained out of her. She began rapidly losing weight and took a few weeks of absence on and off for about six months. Then, she stopped coming in altogether and within two weeks, she had died due to an overdose on dieting pills. This is the hedonic curse at work. To think that such a lovely kind woman had the life drained from her because horrible children thought themselves to be funny as vile to watch. It slowly took a toll on her, losing the happiness boost her job gave her, creating a low feeling which killed her. And that's the hedonic curse. Whilst happy actions can provide less happiness, sad actions or cruel actions can become crueler and crueler the longer one does it. The hedonic curse can be linked to the state of hellish living we've come to lovingly refer as the human condition. This means the pursuit of constant happiness is a bad approach to life, however, it is something wired into every single one of us. The things that provide you with a hedonic boost in the present may not provide you with a source of hedonism in the future. On my average Monday, for example, at about 9am until I pass out to usually 10am, I drink heavy spirits such as Ribena, Oasis, and of course, paint thinners. And whilst at the time it gives me a hedonic boost, by the time Tuesday morning rolls around, I'm aggressively vomiting a rainbow liquid creating a hedonic low. This is a constant throughout my life, and the same could be said about any boost a human may get. Getting married, for an example. That would hopefully allow for a huge hedonic boost allowing for high levels of happiness. But fast forward 20 years and you're in a loveless marriage with a woman who doesn't love you anymore and she's leaving with the kids. Why Carla you bitch why? Whew. Fake anger at my fake wife aside. The hedonic high you get from an activity will always wither away and die over a long enough period of time. Like Nick Cage's career or my dreams of being a world class athlete. However, as previously mentioned, some people can become resilient to both the boosting and lowering of a hedonic mood. The main form of this entails a pattern of positive adaptation to significant adversity or other, according to some very clever folk. These clever folk are from the New York Oxford University Press. This basically means that if a human is being very adaptable, they can keep their hedonic set point relatively close to its baseline when going through a tough or negative experience. Some very clever humans who call themselves psychologists, whatever those are, have worked out that many factors can affect someone's hedonic resilience. Attachment to people, for example, like a husband or a wife or a friend or a family member or a murderer who kidnapped you. Okay, maybe not the last one, but you know, people are into all kinds these days. They also found out if someone is rather happy with themselves and owns the ability to have a positive self-image, they can also remain rather close to their baseline. On top of this, self-regulation, positive behaviour, and of course a positive outlook on life all link in to having a hedonic resilience. These people, who I shall call hedonic wizards, are two things. One, a testimony to how confusingly brilliant our race adapts. And two, smug fucking bastards. Like, well done, you brilliant little sods for being so annoyingly good at humaning, but I, I do not, and I repeat, do not like you for being better at humaning than me. You know what? If you possess the abilities. Disclaimer, this section heavily discusses mental health and if you at all feel uncomfortable with this, please either discontinue watching the video or skip ahead. Thanks. The hedonic curse is a massive jumping off point for mental health problems. The feeling of mundanity can get rather large and the nihilistic views life can bring can lead to some awful mental illnesses. 
There are two factors that can help develop a mental illness, genetics and trauma. Not to go into it in a major way, because I'm not a biologist nor a neuropsychologist, a genetic mental illness can be down to a genetic mutation or a mistake in your DNA, meaning your brain can suffer. Thanks body. A trauma related mental illness can come from some form of outside factor, anything from something simple. Sad things such as your pet dying, to the extreme matters one should never, ever attempt to make light of. Now, mental health issues can come in many forms, which we will discuss in a sensitive manner, as if one were to joke about this in a cruel manner, they'd be evil scum. And to lighten the load, especially of this chapter, I will be playing sweet and wholesome videos between each topic, just to help break it up and provide a little bit of light for what is just a dark and awful topic. To begin with, let's look at anxiety. It is often thought of as an emotion, however there is a very clear and distinguishable line between anxiety the emotion and anxiety the mental health problem. Anxiety disorder is believed to be caused by problems with neurotransmitters. These neurotransmitters produce things like serotonin and dopamine. These chemicals are linked to moods and anxiety disorders. An anxiety disorder can range from such simple things as panicking in a crowd and feeling uneasy in situations to more extreme symptoms such as being unable to leave the home or unable to perform certain tasks, for example taking medicine, due to the fear that the effects listed on the bottle will happen to you. Anxiety affects 3.1% of the US population, which as of 2020 translates to 6.8 million people. Only 42% of this, however, received treatment, which is less than half. GAD being generalized anxiety disorder, whilst being the most common form of anxiety, is also often paired up with major depression. Some other types of common anxiety disorder include panic disorder, social anxiety disorder, specific phobias, stress, obsessive compulsive disorder, and post-traumatic stress disorder, which is usually abbreviated as PTSD. Now onto depression. Depression is often linked to a chemical imbalance such as anxiety, however, research performed by Harvard University suggests that depression doesn't simply spring from having too much or too little of a certain brain chemical. Depression can be caused by faulty mood regulation of the brain, genetic vulnerability, a stressful life situation, medications, and medical problems just to name a few. Depression is often regarded as one of the biggest killers when it comes to mental health and can commonly come with other disorders, such as bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. Depression can come with symptoms such as low mood and feelings of inadequacy to more extreme symptoms such as harming oneself and even suicide. According to MIND, the mental health charity, Depression can be diagnosed in a more specific way, outside of its most common form, clinical depression. The MIND website states the following. There are also some specific types of depression. Seasonal affective disorder, a depression that occurs at a particular time of the year or during a particular season. A persistent depressive disorder, a continuous mild depression that lasts for two or more years. Prenatal depression, a depression that occurs during pregnancy and postnatal depression, a depression that occurs within the first year of a child's birth. The World Health Organization states that more than 264 million people worldwide suffer from depression in all of its forms, however between 76 and 85% of the people in low and middle income countries receive no treatment for this disorder. To put this into perspective, 84.1% of Americans drive 
which means the same amount of American people can legally drive in comparison to those who don't get treated when they suffer from depression. This fact genuinely shocked me, and I really implore you to please, please donate to the charities surrounding mental health. All the charities which I've read into and can safely say are doing amazing jobs are linked in the description. Doing it. He is doing it. Okay, he's gonna commit? Okay. If he if he falls out of that hole, he's gonna have a. Oh yeah, yeah. This is incredible. <laughs> Bipolar disorder is widely believed to also be a result of a chemical imbalance within the brain. The NHS website cites that it can be an imbalance of neuroadrenaline, serotonin, and dopamine. The NHS website also states that there is some evidence which shows that if there is an error in the level of more than one of the neurotransmitters, a person may develop symptoms of bipolar disorder. As an example of this, they have stated that episodes of mania may occur when the levels of neuroadrenaline are too high. On the other side of this, episodes of depression linked with bipolar disorder result from neuroadrenaline levels being too low. However, the NHS also states that genetics could be a cause for this disorder as the same chemical imbalances could run through your family. Symptoms of bipolar can fall into two categories, mania and depression. Mania could have symptoms such as feeling very happy, elated or overjoyed, talking very quickly or feeling full of energy. Looking at the depression side of bipolar, symptoms include feeling sad, hopeless or irritable, most of the time lacking energy and difficulty concentrating remembering things. Looking at statistics supplied by the Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance, bipolar disorder affects approximately 5.7 million Americans, or about 2.6 of the US population aged 18 or older. The median age of onset bipolar disorder is 25 years old, and the illness can start in early childhood or even as late as a person's 40s or 50s. An equal number of men and women can develop bipolar disorder, and it is found in all ages, races, ethnic groups, and social classes. More than two-thirds of people with bipolar disorder have at least one close relative with the illness, indicating that the disease has an inheritable component. It's also stated that bipolar disorder results in 9.2 years reduction in the expected lifespan of a person, and as many as 1 in 5 patients with bipolar disorder commit suicide. Bipolar disorder is the sixth leading cause of disability in the world. Please donate to the Bipolar and Depression Support Alliance. They are amazing people and they do amazing work. <laughs> Why wouldn't you lift your face above the water? <laughs> Nick Lemon does not like the bathtub. <laughs> schizophrenia has many different causes. You may be prone to schizophrenia if you have a stressful or emotional life, which can trigger a psychotic episode. It could be due to genetics. Or again, it could be due to the neurotransmitters in your brain acting up. However, there are studies reported by the NHS that show a patient suffering with schizophrenia partaking a brain scan. This brain scan shows that the brain itself has subtle differences within its structure. These changes are not seen in everyone with schizophrenia, however, they are present and show differences between those who suffer with the illness and those who don't. They suggest schizophrenia may be part of the disorder of the brain, and not just the chemical imbalance. Schizophrenia can be triggered by things like stress, drug abuse, or alcohol abuse. Symptoms of schizophrenia are usually classified into positive and negative symptoms. The NHS defines positive symptoms as any changes in behaviour, thoughts, 
such as hallucinations and delusions. And there are the negative symptoms. Negative symptoms are defined where people appear to be withdrawn from the world around them. Take no interest in everyday social interaction often appear emotionless or flat. Using statistics and direct quotes from mentalhealth.net, worldwide approximately 1% of the population is diagnosed with schizophrenia, and approximately 1.2% of Americans, which translates to 3.2 million people, have the disorder. About 1.5 million people will be diagnosed with schizophrenia this year around the world. In the US, this means more than 100,000 people will be diagnosed, which translates to 7.2% per 1,000 or about 21,000 people within a city of 3 million are likely to be suffering from schizophrenia. If you yourself are suffering from depression or any of the other mental ailments discussed in this section, please, I'm begging you, contact someone, anyone, even me. You matter, and you being in this world is makes everything a bit better. Please reach out. You matter more than you know. After researching into mental health, I decided to perform my own research into it because the best way to understand the topic is to research it yourself. That's what my wife said when it turns out she'd worked out I was cheating on her with the groundskeeper. Pedro. Fuck. Just a forewarning, the next section will be full of scientific mumbo jumbo, so we'll get all the jokes out now. To look into this personally, I needed data, and I couldn't exactly offload this to my wife or the groundskeeper because they both left me, so I had to do it myself. I decided the best method for capturing data was to look at a survey. And then I wrote a survey. First time I've ever done one of them. I decided it would be the best method because I could place it into fancy graphs and pie charts and actually dissect the data and I could contain the results in a format which I'd be able to understand because I'm smooth brained. The survey contained 5 questions. On a scale of 1 to 10, how often do you feel down or sad? On a scale of 1 to 10, how often would you describe your mood as anxious? On a scale of 1 to 10, how often would you describe your mood as depressed? Have you ever been formally diagnosed with any of the following along with a list of mental health ailments? And finally, would you ever consider speaking to a therapist or a trained psychologist? The questions using a scale had a value of 1 which meant never, and 10 which meant always. I decided to have a fair test, I'd leave it open and untouched for 72 hours, and that I'd then shut it down and sift through the response. After 72 hours, once it had shut, we had a grand total of 72 results which to me is just scary. It took me two all-nighters to break it down, and I'm gonna be honest, that was one of the worst ideas I've had in a while, but that's how I roll, baby. I'm a rock star. I'm not. I'm not a rock star. I'd exported all of the results into an Excel sheet with dates and times and results and colour coding, and no identities. Everyone was anonymous. Because I wanted to protect their identities because they're answering sensitive questions. And also, I don't want to dox anyone. I do not want to go back to prison. Guantanamo is scary. After this, I, of course, consulted the wise sages, Anon, Bean, and Dogs Dogs. None of them have a degree in anything data science related. I don't have anywhere near data science. But they're clever bastards, and after 48 hours of no sleep, I decided it was probably best to leave it with people with less sleep deprivation than me who would be able to help ensure my data was accurate and displayed correctly. They came back to me after sedating me for a few hours after I tried to get the Amazon guy to marry me to inform me that the data was present and it was all up to scratch. And they helped me create a few fancy pie charts, bar charts and top chart hits like one of those kid pop songs. correctly show you lot at home the data. So again, big thanks to those relations. Now we have the data and we have the charts to show us all of our accurate information. I needed to work out a way to explain this to you. Now I'm an academic 
and by academic I of course mean the student debt is crushing me slowly and I would like the student company to stop following me. So I assumed it wouldn't be so hard. Little did I know, it would take me literally another two days. And by days I of course mean another 48 hours without sleep. To begin with, let's look at the first question. The first question states that on a scale of 1 to 10, how often do you feel down or sad? Here are the results. As indicated, we have a shared mode of results being 4, 5 and 7. This indicates that most people who answered felt sad some or most of the week. Our highest value indicated that 2.8% of our sample size felt sad constantly throughout the week and our lowest sample showed 1.4% of our sample never felt sad on a weekly basis. Moving on to the next question, on a scale of 1 to 10, how often would you describe your mood as anxious? As can be seen from this chart, a quarter of responses feel anxious a lot of the time, with 4.2% feeling anxious constantly, which is a major sign of suffering from an anxiety disorder. This graph was not exactly a surprise to me. In the current time, we've never had to live as we do. We've never had to hide from the world for the best part of a year, for going human contact for so long, for it just to suddenly be okay to re-enter the world. It's scary. It's a concept not many people were prepared for, myself included. It could be considered a factor that may affect my results, as we are still in the woods and the clearing is still potentially a while away, especially with recent developments. So the thoughts can bring around some certain anxieties. And on a personal note, it is okay to feel this way. We will all get through this. You're doing great. Look at you. Whatever you've done with your hair is amazing. And that outfit really goes well with it. You're doing your best. Moving on to the next question, on a scale of 1 to 10, how often would you describe your mood as depressed? This result I was pleasantly surprised with. Our mood result is a score of 2, which was chosen by 23.6% of people. This means that they feel depressed very little of the time. Not to say that feeling this way is wrong because as discussed previously, some people don't exactly have much of a choice. Our highest value showed that 2.8% of people feel depressed all the time, which is a major sign that they're suffering from a mental health disorder and should definitely speak to someone. Our lower value showed that 9.7% of people never felt depressed, which is honestly heartwarming news, as depression is an awful thing which no one should ever have to suffer with. Moving on to our fourth question, have you ever formally been diagnosed with any of the following? This question gave a list of options as well as a box to insert your own answer into it as my options were not as broad as they should have been, which is something I will factor in next time. Here is a table of results. As can be seen from this graph, we have an overwhelming majority of people who don't suffer from any mental illness. This 100% links into real world due to not many people actually having to suffer with it as the data has shown. We can see the next largest answer is anxiety, which again lines up with the present data we've previously looked at. We then have depression, followed by autism and OCD, then followed by bipolar, PTSD, anorexia and body dysmorphic disorder. We even have a zero result for schizophrenia. These all line up with the data we've looked throughout the video. This proves that the data we've looked at does actually match up with data I've collected which improves the validity of the results and it also shows that whilst a lot of people don't actually suffer with it anyone can actually suffer with a mental illness especially during these troubled times that we're in now looking at the last question would you ever speak to a therapist or a trained psychologist now this question wasn't exactly to compare with other data we've looked at, this comes from a personal curiosity of mine. I know people who have personally spoken to therapists at points in their lives, and I wanted to see if it was a general consensus or not. Here is the chart. 
As can be seen on the graph, I was pleasantly surprised that 54.2% of the sample indicated that they would in fact speak to a therapist or a trained psychologist. This was surprising due to the cagey nature especially of British people. 25% of the sample indicated that maybe they would, maybe they wouldn't, and 20.8% of people indicated a no response. Now that we've looked through the data and come to conclusions, what now? Well, to begin with I hope that this whole video has educated you on the matter even just slightly. Secondly, I hope it helps you to take the time out to go speak to someone, a friend, a family, stranger, your ex-wife. I hope you can teach them something or help them. And mostly, I do genuinely hope you consider donating to one of the many charities listed in the description as they do so much for so many people and they're genuinely brilliant. I hope that you've enjoyed and remember you are doing bloody brilliant and I'm sure you're gonna continue doing grand so please don't go anywhere because the world is brighter with you in it. Stay safe and for the sake of science, fuck you Andrew Wakefield, I've got more than 12 people in my responses, suck my dick.